studies haven't been put together in any particular order, any particular theme, but there are some themes that one of my jobs is to pick up, pick out and go through, which we'll, we'll go through. But it, please be quick, we've got a few more to get through. Oh, well, it will take as long as it takes. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I'm Philip Griffin from Radstock Primary School in early in Reading, which is in Wokingham, LA. And I would like to explain some of the things that we've been doing and the views that we're beginning to take on, what, on using technology in our classrooms. So, <clears throat> let's go back. You've seen on the internet, I'm sure, the video which, or the videos, I think there's more than one, which show Victorian learning and comp compare and contrast how that learning is taking place now. And they show the video and it shows that industry and office work has changed considerably. But in the classroom, things are actually very similar. We've changed from simply, in many cases, a Victorian class facing their blackboard to a class facing an interactive whiteboard still fulfilling the same role. They offer lots of interactive and exciting ways, but are they always used that way? Is the salutary uh, happening of me going to my children's secondary school? Oh, we use PowerPoint all the time now on our interactive whiteboards. It's rather a salutary experience because that's not being interactive at all. So it's still being used going from page one to page two. So, but we know, of course, that it's different like that. There's a lot of good use of interactive whiteboards around. And there's a lot of good use of a lot of teaching and learning policies, which are gradually becoming learning and teaching policies. Pupils have become learners. Teachers, though, are still teachers. The classroom has changed. The image of people facing the whiteboard may be true, but the changes are far more profound in many of our best classrooms. Clear learning objectives, success criteria, context are set out for the children to follow. So, the children are now far more involved in their own education. They're beginning to take control. Not completely yet, but they're beginning to. So what's changed most in the last few years? Is it the technology? Is that the promised land? Or is it the pedagogy? How we teach the children? And we started off in computing education, 1980s, with good old logo. And that was one view of using computers in education. Another view was, of course, you plug the child into the computer and they learn that way. But we gave the children more chance to create. And that's where we started off from. And then, of course, in 1990s in this country, it changed because a massive investment into ICT and education happened and all sorts of targets and training started to happen. National strategies were devised in all sorts of areas of the curriculum. Targets, impact became more essential. And there came a change of heart. The mechanistic view disappeared, I think. And, but at the same time, of course, computer technology moved on. We began to use mobile devices. Social networking came. And the vision of one-to-one -one access for children in, in personal computers began to be a reality in some of our classrooms. So how has the pedagogy changed in the last few years? What have we done to really influence learning? Is the pedagogy more important than technology? Well, best practice has changed. It's really embarrassing now watching non-teacher guests come and educate your class or try to because they still play, guess what's in my head? That traditional game which teachers once played. 
the teachers in the audience, of course, now know that different strategies apply, that they use talk partners and other ways of actually getting the children to respond. And of course, theories have changed. Future Lab have created an inquiry cycle. The work assessment for learning group have actually looked at how using success criteria and so on can improve children's learning. So these important things have been taking place. And the children are taking their own learning journey far more. They are really engaged in their learning, not because of the use of technology, but because of the use of a different pedagogy. The control of the learning is, take, is moving from the teacher to the learner. Although, of course, the teacher still has to, as in Dawn's case, be aware of the big O coming in at some point. So what's it look like to have a learner-enabled classroom? There would be whole class discussions. The teacher will ask questions, but as a facilitator more than anything else. And they'd use interactive resources to talk and learn. So the children begin to create their own learning tasks and work on their own. But the technology has changed everything, of course. Give children those devices, whether they be iPod touches or other devices, and what can change? Well, what can change is nothing. What can change is nothing. If the pedagogy doesn't change, then the learning doesn't change. So first, the interactive whiteboard. Trouble is with interactive whiteboard, on its own, it doesn't necessarily mean for change. It can lead to death by PowerPoint. Most of them can only be used by one person at a time. When we talk about collaborative learning, that can become different, difficult. And then we've got the internet, another technology which we've got in our classrooms. Wi-Fi internet in many cases. It means that many people connect, many people can share information. And then we've got a learning platform. The next piece in the jigsaw. A safe place, and the safe is very important. A safe place for children to interact. Not just out on the internet anywhere. And I'm sure that some people disagree that a learning platform is the only place to be. But once you've experienced e-safety issues, then it becomes a very high priority indeed. And then, of course, the personalised device. We use Nokia internet tablets to, for the children to access the internet and the learning platform. But there are a variety of other options, obviously. But each child has one to one access. And that is really where the dream begins to become a reality. And we have gone for handheld devices rather than portable devices. Our handheld devices can be used on the desk. They can only also be used on the desk when the desk is your lap. But they can also be used elsewhere. They can be used anywhere. They can be used out on the field, on the beach, on a field trip, taking pictures drawing, sketching, they can record sound, they can record video, they could do all sorts of things. Trouble is the device to do all those things doesn't quite exist yet, or at least not at a decent price. So the technology is beginning to influence the learning because it can take place anywhere in whatever environment. So the 21st century classroom is a different place. 21st century classroom is still a classroom though, because if we are still to deal with cyberbullying and other social networking issues, we need to give the children a sense of the other humanity of the other people involved. And I believe that without a classroom and children getting together and learning, that's not so easy to do. So how can the devices the internet, the learning platform, the smart board, influence the pedagogy. Well, we create opportunities 
for learners to say what they know, what they don't know, and what they want to know. We base this on the national curriculum, but we use forums and collaborative tools using the, the handheld devices to do so. We produce confident children that can decide what they want to learn. We can make the, give them clear learning objectives and success criteria in context using the learning platform and then use that as a learn, le, launch pad for them to do their own work. On the learning platform, we store everything. We store the resources that need. We store the links to other websites so they can use the handheld devices to go and look at different resources. So on this page, there are easy resources and harder resources. The child can choose which they look at, operating at various different levels. They become involved in their learning. They can express and meet those success criteria in a variety of ways, not just one way. They may choose to meet those success criteria using the learning platform or using the word processor on their device. They may use paper and pencil. The outcome may be a drawing, it may be a piece of writing, as long as the success criteria are met. The, success, the outcome might be video, it might be a photo story, but the outcome is valid if the success criteria are met. And of course we can use forums to improve and peer review things. So here we have an improving a sentence forum with children of different abilities writing their improved sentence. Commenting on each other's sentences, improving each other's sentences. And of course we've got children creating their own e-portfolios of what is important to them. So, we have children using devices. So which is more important? Could we make good use of the technology without the pedagogy being appropriate? Well, the technology has to be of a high standard. But without a pedagogy which involves the children and takes note of all the advances in the last few years, we may be up a dead end. And so the three R's have become the three C's, or four C's, depending on which way you want to write it. No longer the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, but the three C's, create, communicate, collaborate. And I've caught in my ways. Uh, because it was available at the time. It did the things we wanted to do, well, most of them, and it was an inexpensive device. Would you, well, how do you think the market has moved over the time you've been doing projects? The ideal device, as far as I know, doesn't exist. Because it needs to be Wi-Fi without 3G, because that's too expensive, unless Vodafone or someone is going to subsidise it. Um, and obviously the N800s and N810s are now beginning to show their age. And they don't have video capability, as the newer devices will have. What do you think of the question? I'm, I'm sorry, you'll have to speak up. I'm slightly deaf, and so I'm afraid you really have to shout at me. Do you use the devices to connect to your learning platform? We use the devices to connect to the Lion learning platform. They have, obviously they can use other things as well. They can use the inbuilt software on the device, but the main, one of the main uses is via the learning platform, so we can share and collaborate. Certainly in the past that has been outside the school. However, the internet tablets are so good at connecting to uh, Wi-Fi that we have e-safety issues with the tablets connecting to unprotected Wi-Fi out of schools, so we have decided to lock them down until that issue can be addressed. I'll tell you a little story there about Wi-Fi and uh, unsecured networks. I decided to do some testing at home with an OLPC, so I decided to unsecure my Wi-Fi. So I left uh, for about 20 minutes, and I found a young, young man sitting on top of my wheelie bin outside my house with his DS connected to my Wi-Fi. Uh, I thought it showed a great deal of ingenuity, but it's an interesting point.
I just wondered about, um, you spoke about the pedagogy, and I wondered if your pedagogy was based on Dewey's pedagogy, um, and if it was based on Dewey's, what were some of the changes you made? Are you familiar with Dewey's in in inquiry cycle, or? We, we, I mean, our work is based on the work of Shirley Clark, mainly, rather than the work of the other ones. But we have looked at the other ones, but we are clearly in following the lead of Shirley Clark with her learning objectives, context, and success criteria, and peer review, and collaborative marking, and so on. a site called Web of Trust and you can download it and it will tell you whether or not the site you're on is trustworthy. I don't know if you can use that for your students at all, but I... Uh, I mean, the, the N800s and N810s are very simple devices and you cannot easily download things onto them. They're also Linux-based. But um, we have been running a campaign with our parents to make sure they've locked all their Wi-Fis so that uh, even if they, their children can access it, other, others cannot. Because it was obviously an issue in the community that parents were, had obviously been left behind and simply did not realise that leaving their Wi-Fi open was a potential hazard for children, other children or young people in the neighbourhood. Any other uh, You mentioned e-portfolios. Can I just ask how you're getting your students to, to use them? Well, we're using the inbuilt um, e-portfolio within the learning platform we use, Uniservity, and that's how we're doing it. We are only just starting on that journey, however. We've not really got very far with it yet, but that is our intention. As you can see, most of our work is on the learning platform or other things embedded within the learning platform because that is a safe place and we can control it. I'm sorry those people that don't like us controlling it, but in the end, with, after the e-safety issues we've had, we really have no alternative. It's really interesting that Philip mentioned the idea of it's only a simple device. Uh, I studied geography at university 30 years ago, uh, and I spent my I'm a, I am a punch card person. I started on punch cards, and I spent uh, the best part of uh, three months trying to get a simple project working with mapping postcodes to work. I can now do that with Google Mashups on a mobile phone. Uh, and more importantly, with Google Maps, you can do it on your average phone. When you're talking about the phones in this country, it's an interesting one that Philip's brought up about e-safety. You will not be able to buy a phone in the UK who will not receive email or browse the web by probably the end of the second quarter of 2010, 2011. And that brings with it some interesting issues about e-safety and, and, and uh, challenges such as that. Any other questions for Philip? Philip, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.